Hi, and welcome to myself, Ken McCarthy, on Who's Zooming Who? Uh, this is going to be episode nine. And speaking with me this week uh, is a man who is absolutely no stranger to the world of educational technology um, and uh, has been involved in EdTech in Ireland for uh, quite a number of years. Uh, currently, he's the head of online learning innovation in the Centre for Online Learning in IT Sligo. Uh, and IT Sligo are perhaps one of the pioneers of online learning in Ireland and with uh, a, a huge number of courses that I'm sure Brian is going to tell us all about. Um, but before we do, I'm going to ask Brian to maybe to introduce himself uh, and fill in some of the, the, the details that I've obviously missed out on there. So Brian, you're most welcome to Who's Zooming Who. Thanks very, very much for agreeing to, to take part. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to, to our chat. Thanks very much, Ken, for the kind introduction and for the invitation to take part in this. I've been listening to some of the others. They're fascinating. I think it's a great idea. Um, about myself, uh, I've been in IT Sligo since, I, I want to say the year dot, but it's not. 1970 is the year dot here. I was here in 1984. I came when I was 14 years of age. Well, no, like <laughs> I was a bit older. But I wasn't that long out of college. Um, I often say it to people, I remember at the interview for the job, it was in late 83, they asked me, they said, you're not long out of college uh, and you've worked as an engineer. How do you feel about teaching? And I said, well, I'm not that long out of college. I know how it shouldn't be done. And they offered me the job. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I, I did engineering and I have to say, this probably annoys a lot of um, non-engineers, but I really feel I use an engineering mindset in my work and I didn't even work as an engineer for that long but to me it's just about using technology to solve problems to make things better to make things more efficient to stop waste those type of ideas so as I said I came in 84 I was le lecturing in engineering and computing my background was in sort of simulation and civil engineering so I was an old Fortran programmer um, uh, but even then, even in the 80s, I had Commodore 64s and I was experimenting with a language called Pilot, which was for um, which was for automating teaching. That's what it was meant to be for. But I think <laughs> I think 20 years was littered with failures because Pilot just wasn't going to work. Even in the 90s, we I started looking at authoring systems and they were just too heavy duty it was take a hundred a hundred hours to develop an hour of material and i couldn't afford them anyway uh, i suppose my first success in edtech was um we got a system a uh, windows-based system called question designer for for doing quizzes and that's it i put my students through so many quizzes uh to the point where i i i was point when i finished teaching i wasn't given any examinations at all they were all being auto corrected um uh i was appointed i was very interested in learning technology through the 90s and i was appointed education technology officer in 97 half time uh and um where I was supposed to help other lecturers use technology in their teaching. Another failure. <laughs> I made no progress at all. Uh, the best thing I did in that three years was probably uh, to, uh, I did do a bit of research on uh, automated assessment, but I ran, a, I ran a seminar in Sligo on EdTech and got loads of people from all over the country to come. I couldn't believe it. And then I just realized that nobody was doing it. So in the year 2000, we ran the first, I ran the first EdTech conference. And I called it EdTech 2000, the first annual education technology users conference, because I knew that would make me have to do a second one. So that's where EdTech took off. In 2000, as I was going nowhere with that job. So I actually asked to go back to lecturing. And that's when I asked the head of engineering, I said, um, how about we get into distance learning? I think there's more scope in a greenfield site than there is. And sure, by 2002, we started with five students in a distance, an online distance learning program. And that wasn't all that much of a success. 
because we were using this wraparound model, which we would use textbooks and asynchronous discussion. And you couldn't teach maths that way. It was hard enough to teach technology that way, but you definitely couldn't teach statistics and all that sort of stuff. So it took us about 18 months and then we got, um, we got, oh, it was Horizon Wimber or something. I think it's the forerunner of Blackboard's Collaborate now, actually. Um, and uh, we got a big whiteboard, so we were able to just do live classes. And really it took off from that. Uh, once we figured out how to do PowerPoint and writing on the board and really just replicating what the lecturers did already. So I, I suppose I was... 20 years looking for a success <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, finally got one and it and turned and out to be a really did, good one because you finally uh, found it brilliant three and a half thousand learners now and the edtech conference took off great as well so uh, it, it did uh, and i was back um in sligo at edtech maybe three years ago uh, yeah, yeah, so I'm, not, I'm not i'm not sure what number that one was um yeah. But it was good, and it was good fun, and and the campus there was was, was absolutely fantastic. I have to admit uh, that the northwest um, is is slightly far away from the southeast. Um, yes, indeed. So 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 getting to Stanford, I was at that second Waterford years, ago. <laughs> <laughs> and you haven't been back since. <laughs> the the uh, no, your story is absolutely fascinating, I, and I'm thinking back, um, you know, to to, to 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 all the different uh, innovations uh, and inventions uh, that that. that that you mentioned there. Uh, when well, you mentioned 1984, and this will probably age me, and you certainly aged yourself. I actually was 14 in 1984, so, um, <laughs> uh, but 15 maybe, but, um, and I think I was doing my, my, my junior search. And as you mentioned, uh, the Commodore 64, um, I had this great idea for the Young Scientist exhibition to have this um, Maths 64 as a, as a way to teach maths on the Commodore oh, 64. Cool. Uh, I got as far as designing the, the, the login or the, the kind of logo screen because I could do that bit. <laughs> um, it's just my, my problem was that I wasn't very good at math. So I, I was never going to be um, uh, working on this one as, as, as a solo one. So 3,000 learners, you said now? Three and a half thousand. Three and a half thousand. Three three thousand. Well, three sorry. The moment and, Fantastic. Uh, Across how many programs, Brian? Well, we had, I think, 125 last year. We've about 140 this year. Um, the thing is about the model of live online teaching is that it's, it's very similar to your existing teaching methods. It's relatively simple. But if you do it well, I mean, this is the thing about classroom teaching as well, is classroom teaching or lecturing can be good if you do it well. And it's the same with live online teaching. If you do it well, it can be good. But one of its big benefits is that it's simple. So, and you don't need a lot of students to break even as opposed to say the model that came through from the nineties, particularly in the U S and the open university and is really invest a whole pile of money in materials. Whereas really what we did is replicated good quality classroom teaching. Uh, so it's a, it's financially, it's a straightforward model. It may not be the one that wins out in the end, but there's a good bit left in it yet, you know. I forgot your question. No, no, no. I was, I was asking what your three and a half thousand. You, 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 yeah. you didn't quite so forget it. To some it's extent, the, the reason yeah. for growth. I mean, sure. apart from the fact that I must be a relatively good persuader because I've spent my time going around to program boards, <laughs> talking to people and talking to people at coffee and persuading people. And I'm saying, yeah, yeah, we'll give it a go. Uh, so um, that maybe that's part of it too. I don't know. Sure. And look, I, 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 as you can tell from 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 these series of conversations, or, and I, I struggle to say the word podcast, even though that's what it is, and podcast kind of rolls off the tongue a little bit more naturally. Um, I'm a great believer in giving it a go because um, yeah. if you, if you wait till everything is perfect and everything is just right, you, you and keep well, it simple, uh, you could you could well end up uh, waiting uh, an awful long time. I think before we started um, re recording our chat, we had, we had a brief um, comparing notes as, as I do with these things, but you, you did say one thing that I'm just going to come back to, um, and you mentioned, you, you kind of briefly touched on them and you said that good online teaching is not too dissimilar to good classroom teaching. Um, but you mentioned the importance of communication, and I guess one of the big things for me is that the, the, the technologies that we have now, 
uh, and you're able to facilitate communication probably better than ever before. So perhaps maybe you, you might have an opinion on that or, or, or a thought on, on that. Yeah, I remember I used to use a slide when I was explaining to people about this approach to online teaching. And I used to have a slide that just said, it's communication, not content. Okay, students love clarity. They love to know where they stand. So simple things like every week, sending a message to students saying, this is what we're gonna be doing this week, and this is what I expect you to do, and you know, things like that. And if a student has a query, not leaving it four days to get back to them, you know, those things matter an awful lot to students, and they're simple. When it comes to, I mean, I'm probably, say for instance, a lot of people give out about the lecture and death by PowerPoint, but it's not PowerPoint's fault if it's used badly. I've seen people with PhDs in education with slides that are just big long lists and tons of words. If you teach a lecture, simple, effective PowerPoint use, how to present, those types of things, to give good lectures, that's good communication. And that's really the essence, I think, of what it is. Simple, good communication can get you an awful distance. And that's even before we get to instructional design. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, will we? Uh, maybe, maybe no, we will. We uh, but just, just before we get, get to that, I suppose, look, uh, communication now, um, in the times we find ourselves in where we don't have a campus to fall back on uh, in the physical sense anymore um, and all of our students uh, okay at this stage uh, for the most part they're probably finished uh, but certainly for the last uh, eight nine ten weeks now um, have been learning um, at home um, have been studying at home uh, without the interaction that they might normally have uh, with lecturers and, and other students uh, on the physical campus and obviously have had to uh, complete assessments uh, at home as well. So in IT Sligo you have these three and a half thousand students that were learning online all of the time and um, but obviously you know I was in your physical campus so you had students that used, used to arrive in, in the door uh, every morning as well. How was the transition for those students to the um, as a result of COVID-19? Well we think it was okay. I'm going to be honest with you here and say it's hard to know. Uh, we're, we're not hearing horror stories coming back, really. You know, we're not hearing bad. We're not hearing a big outrage by the students that they've not been served well. We have got good feedback from lecturers that they, we've got, we've got a, about five instructional designers. So they've been able to give great support to lectures. So the lectures have been telling us they're happy with the support, although some of them have had problems with broadband. Um, so by and large, as far as we know, it's gone smoothly enough. Um, and I mean, our advice would have been to lecturers, just communicate well with your students. And you could, you might all almost argue that the, the lecturers with good communication skills are likely to have survived better in this than the lecturers with good technical skills, although both are very useful, but being able to communicate again. Am I banging on about communication a bit? <laughs> no, no, I, I mentioned not. communication. I, yeah, no, but, but these tools, uh, you know, I think a lot of the time um, people get, you know, I can, I can tell from, from the, the initial part of this conversation, um, no more than myself, um, that you like the technology um, but the technology is only a tool um, and, and any technology unless it doesn't work or doesn't do what you want it to do and and, and you highlighted a number of things you, you call them uh, using your own words failures there um, when, when you're introducing them but i think you were probably being a little bit harsh on yourself insofar as that you just found that they didn't um, suit um, the purpose that you wanted them to do so you moved on to something that perhaps suited a little bit better um, so um, fail, fail um, I did see once defined as first attempt in learning, but it's, it's a little bit forced, um, so maybe, maybe, maybe we won't. No, 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 I would be a great believer in fail better, fail, you know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. and <laughs> I might say, the only reason I know so much is because I've failed so much. No, that's, that's not strictly true. I don't know as much as I'd like to know, but an awful lot I have learned has been from trying things and saying, well, that didn't work. Mm. And uh, now I do read research and I read an awful lot. So you learn from other people's failures too, or other people's successes too. 
Yeah. Sure. No, I, I do think that um, a lot of the time in, I suppose, in, in, in life in general, but in, maybe in education in particular, uh, there's a fear of failure that can paralyze you to not even try. Mm -hmm. And I think that's worse than any failure. Um, it's just not to try something. And yeah. sometimes you need to take that step and be prepared to look foolish. Um, but you know what? Maybe it'll work as well. Do, do you think, and I suppose just coming back again to your, to your normal undergraduate on campus students, do you, do you think your experience um, in your online programs helped you prepare better uh, or respond better? Um, or did it make any difference? Was it? Was it I, I think it did. It, it, it must have. Um, in two in two ways. One is that probably 60% of the staff here in Sligo have taught online. Uh, so for them, it wasn't a, a particular challenge to move the campus-based students online. That would be a very high percentage compared to other colleges. But also they're friends with other lecturers and lecturers knew who to phone. And, and often they prefer to ask a colleague than to ask the technical support staff. So that helped as well. And it was, we did hear word that, you know, people were helping each other out. So I suspect, oh yeah, I, I definitely the amount of online distance learning we're doing did help us a lot. Yeah, no, I, I, and I'd anticipate that it would. And, and just, I suppose, the corollary of that question is, so we know what happened with your um, undergraduate on-campus students and, and obviously how they were impacted. Did it make any difference to your online programs or did they just continue business as usual? Or well, That's a good question, actually, because I haven't fully checked that out because I'm not that involved in the day-to-day -day now. I'm more involved in the innovation projects. Uh, but obviously it wasn't going to hit the teaching much. But where it would affect is an assessment. And to be honest with you, even with campus, the assessment, that was the number one challenge that we were put to us, and I'm sure to other institutions around the country, was not so much how we're going to finish the teaching for the year, but how are we going to assess them? So that was our first challenge. And even our online learners come to, they, we have a centre in Cork, and they go to the Red Cow in Dublin, and they come to Sligo. And those exams, we weren't able to hold those. So trying to get people to, to assess. Now, we have, we have some experience in running online proctored exams for our overseas students, uh, but we decided not to go wholesale for that for Irish students, Irish online students. We decided that we would do similar to what we were doing with campus students, which was to, uh, to um, explore alternative methods of assessment. And to be honest with you, it's probably done, lectures are great, you know, it's been a great learning process. I think are there are other things other than final exams that you have to do. I know there was a few here in the instructional design area that were thrilled that people had to finally think about other ways of assessing their students, you know. Yeah, I, look, I think uh, no more than ourselves, um, we struggle with uh, all of those similar kinds of challenges as well. Um, we did, I think, pretty much decide earlier on that proctored exams were never going to be a thing for us. Um, not least of a couple of reasons for that. Number one, we wouldn't have had a lot of experience with it, first and foremost. Um, and I don't know that we would have been able to ramp it up to the scale that would have been required uh, in, in the time frame that we had uh, available. So again, it was a fairly... Well, probably you may not have, because in actual fact, I think a lot of our exams depended on proctors that were live proctors. Sure. And a lot of those were suddenly not allowed to attend work yes. because of uh, physical distancing. Yeah. And the proctoring capacity reduced anyway. Yeah, no, it, it, it was something that I, th I think the conversation took no more than one or possibly two sentences uh, before we moved on to sort of um, what, what, what the next thing was. I, I do think a lot of the time with, with education in general and, and probably higher education in particular, we can be a, a small bit of a hostage to fortune and that this is the way we've always done it. So even when you talk about assessment for 
uh, particular modules, but we've always assessed it this way. So um, wh why would we feel the need to change it? And, and nobody particularly wants to experiment on this. They absolutely have to. I do think one of the, one of the fantastic um, silver linings in what is a terribly tragic situation, obviously, um, is that it's forced people to do things that they said they could never um, imagine doing. And I'm not saying that this is going to change everything uh, forever, but it might change some things. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I do think from, from having been a student comparatively recently myself, um, uh, when I first came back into education in, in 2013, it is now, I remember doing a, a classroom based uh, or, or end of term or end of semester exam um, for the five credit module in, in a business uh, higher diploma I was doing. And at the same time, another one of those five credit modules, I was doing a significant sort of project, piece of project work. And even though notionally they were both worked five, credit, uh, five credits, um, I can tell you here and now that the, the project one I had to put way more work into than going in and, and sitting down for an exam for two hours. Um, the hardest part about the exam <laughs> was probably um, the, the cramp I had in my hand from, from writing that much um, for the first time. In a way, that's unfair. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's not, yeah. it's not necessarily that way because it's a better way to assess you. It's, to some extent, it's badly thought out. Uh, what would you say, um, learning design, particularly just in terms of uh, student effort. Yeah. And as is a problem with projects with students is they often don't know how to rationalize Stop. effort. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, 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 was, that, I was that soldier. Um, yeah. But we, we were probably encouraged as well. Yeah. Um, so if, if nothing else happened um, as a result of uh, this, this change uh, right across the sector, if it started signaling the death knell of um, terminal exams in, in exam hall situations, it, I I'm think not, it would be a good thing. I'm, I'm not totally against exams. I think they have their place. I like to see a good mix. I like okay. to see corroborating evidence. <laughs> of yeah, maybe, maybe I just so much for continuous assessment. And a, a continuous assessment is wide open to cheating. It doesn't sure. matter what turn it in or whatever you use is just wide open to all sorts of cheating and inaccuracies. Uh, whereas summative examinations, particularly closed ones, don't really test all the learning outcomes. But to some extent, using one against the other, you're sort of providing sort of uh, corroborating evidence. You know, sure. the, 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 if, if one isn't matching the other, you know, something's gone wrong there. Yes, I, 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 I take what you're saying to an extent and I can see uh, the argument, but I suppose I kind of keep coming back to the, the whole exam type situation is something that you'll never face in the real world when you're doing the real job that uh, you went to college to, to, to train for. Um, you know, we, we have the sum total of human knowledge in our pockets now with, with, with our yeah. smartphones. Um, I prefer that rather than teaching people to give bad answers, which is what I think sometimes you get in exams, we teach them how to find better answers um, using the tools that they have. But look, that's... that's, that's, that's no, that's, uh, to be honest with you, I do basically agree with you. That, <laughs> you know, we do Good. need more authentic assessment. But, it, and in a way, I think we need more authentic learning as well. Because, sure. Uh, I mean, I would now like to work, and I hope to work in it, last few years I have on project-based learning because I just think we don't need classroom-based learning anymore. Okay. So, uh, and, and to some extent that's rightly aligned with what you just said, which is that it's, you're talking about authentic assessment, you know, what you can do. Uh, but the best way to learn to do is those things is by doing these things, sure. sitting in the class. So, Project-based learning is probably the best way. And just learn what you need to know to do the project. Learn maybe a few other things that you need to know for the profession, even though you might use them in the project. But the project is where you really do the learning, you know. Sure. And, and are you working on particular projects in that area at the moment, or is it? Ah, they're at very seminal stages. Okay. Uh, I'm, I suppose, getting some funding and space to do them. I'm still working on that. Excellent. I just, I, I just wanted... I suppose to say that 
essentially I do agree with you, and I think that's where we should be putting our efforts that in, in that area. So, so, so watch this space. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and I suppose that, that, that probably dovetails nicely with where, where I was hoping uh, the conversation might go next in terms of, so we've spoken a little bit about obviously your own uh, tech background, and we've spoken um, about IT cybers, um, in, incredible uh, pedigree and, and, and uh, history uh, in innovating in that online uh, learning space in, in Ireland. Um, I guess for the last, uh, for the end of this semester and perhaps the start of the next semester in, in 2020, 2021, um, we're all going to be online to, to, to some extent uh, or another. Um, but eventually COVID-19 uh, will pass um, and either effective treatments will be de developed or uh, perhaps a vaccine will be developed. Um, and normality, um, in whatever that means, will, will return. What what would you think at this um, from 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 this uh, remove? How would you see the legacy that this is going to have uh, on the Irish higher education system, or do you think it'll just go back to the way it was? I I mean I don't think it'll go back to the way it was because it's it's sort of gradually changing. There's this there's this gradual change, and the curve you could say is upwards all the time. Things are getting better. People's attitudes are changing. People's skills are changing. So you could say it's just a step up, you know. Uh, so when it's over, we may find that we got an instant 20% improvement, but no, no, no radical change, just bits more, more of the better stuff we were doing might happen. More lectures might be involved in using technology back with their campus students, doing more flipped learning, uh, things like that. And more ideas planted in people's heads. So it could be five years before you see the payoff of what people learned during this. Um, so I think it's just been a slight little boost under it. Uh, and uh, or not, probably more than slight, a significant but still modest boost under the continuous improvement that we we all do all the time. Sure, I, I think look, you, you probably hit on again um, some of my own thinking in that regard. In that, uh, all of what we're doing right now. Um, probably wouldn't have been popular, notwithstanding that some people still have access issues and uh, as we spoke about, but probably wouldn't have been possible 10, 15, and certainly 20 years ago. Um, and, and all of that was enabled by the fact that, you know, a lot of homes have decent speed broadband, yeah, you know, a lot of mobile phones have decent yeah. speed broadband. Um, mm. I couldn't imagine trying to do this in the dial-up world. Um, and um, this is to get off the internet, I want to use the house phone. Um, most people don't even have a house phone anymore. So uh, th those days are, 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 are long since gone. As well as that, I, I, I'm guessing, you know, the institutions would have had uh, a VLE of some description that was being used to some extent um, that enabled uh, the facilitation to move online and um, some of the tools like video conferencing tools very quickly became uh, available and, and were adopted and um, I think I've seen more different things happening on Zoom and other platforms like that though that I would have ever imagined um, possible. Um, and I said the other thing that surprises me is the, the speed with which people have just adopted these things. Um, and it's, it's, again, it's probably coming back to when you have to do something, um, you just do it. Um, it's occurred to me that it was very good of the pandemic to wait until now to hit us because it could have hit us 10 years ago, you're right. Uh, and now so many people had been using FaceTimes and you know various things just for social reasons and sort of had got used to the idea at least they'd seen their kids doing it and things like that. So a lot of these lectures at least understood what the concept was. And it 
it was timely enough. Actually, it's a very interesting question. I hadn't thought about that before. Yeah, no, no. It, 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 like if this had happened 15 years ago. Yeah, and, I, and I've no doubt, I mean, look, my, 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 both my own parents uh, are deceased now, sadly, but I do remember when, when my mum was still alive. Um, she had a, a, an iPhone and was able to use Facebook. Um, and the driver wasn't that she wanted to be on social media. The driver was she wanted to know what her grandkids were doing. Um, so, you know, again, it probably comes back to something I touched on earlier on the conversation that technology is just a tool. Um, so it wasn't, I want to use the iPhone because it's the latest, the greatest phone. And yeah, there's some people like that. Uh, but I want to use the iPhone because I can get on Facebook and I can see what... Uh, my grandkids in Australia are doing, or I can see what uh, my grandkids in Dublin or where, wherever else they, they, they were. Um, and I think like that, um, the technology and the tools that are available to us and are kind of just embedded into everyday life now, uh, probably facilitated um, this, this, this transition um, to this remote teaching um, in a way that certainly couldn't have happened, uh, certainly couldn't have happened in the past. And yeah, so maybe some of it will stick, maybe. Um, yeah. Well, one, one thing I would say is that I think it would be unfortunate if all we learned from this was how to do what we're doing already in a different way. There's, there's far more wrong with education than just our use of technology. You know, we... We need to be much more radical about how we approach change in education. And I think we have to be looking at these technologies and say, how would this enable us to do things in a totally radically different way that we couldn't have done before because we have them, you know, because we have the tools. Uh, in, in manufacturing, they refer to it as digitalization rather than digitization in other words i'm sure it is in business as well digitization being we take what we've done before and we do a digital version of it you know whereas digitalization is well what new ways of doing things are there new you know so how do we leverage all the free education out there? Do we how how do we allow students to study how they want to study and then we just assess them and give them credits for it? Or how do we accept credits from other organizations? How do we, you know, how do we give them freedom to do far more than they've done before? Um, we need to be thinking a bit more radically about it rather than just saying, how can I do what I'm doing now in a slightly different way with technology? Sounds like a very interesting manifesto. Where do I uh, where do I buy a copy of this? Uh, <laughs> the the uh, no. Well, it, there's it, a lot. There is a lot of talk internationally about you know, like uh, Southern New Hampshire's announcement there two weeks ago, three weeks ago. They're totally getting rid of lectures on campus. You come to campus. You study online, you can do projects, you can get into study groups. I mean, they're just thinking totally radically. Now their objective is to bring down the cost of education, which is horrendous in the US, you know. So uh, this is sort of, they see this is the only way we can do it. Um, but that's for their campus learning, by the way. Uh, and then they have all that online learning because they have 130,000 online students, they have about six or 7,000 campus students. So they put the campus students into online courses. But it, it's thinking more radically. And there's there are other models in different places of different ways of doing it as well. Fantastic. I can't yeah. see I can't see why anyone in the future will do a master's degree in a college. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, I, I can see why you would certainly say that. I mean, I think um, on-campus education definitely has a place for your traditional undergraduate out of school um, wants the college experience and maybe is still trying to find themselves. Mm. Um, uh, master's degrees, uh, number one, for anybody who doesn't do it straight away after they finish their undergraduate degree um, and comes back uh, several years later, it's always going to be a challenge because taking that time out of work, uh, finding the money to do it, um, or maybe finding the motivation to do it when you have uh, all those other life issues um, getting in the way as well um, uh, must must be a challenge. Um, so 
I, I can see certainly in that kind of cohort or group of students where um, more project based on the job applied uh, learning that's that's accredited and credentialed um, by, by a partner institute yeah. uh, might, 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 might be more attractive. No, it's, it's been a fascinating conversation and I, I, I've said this at the end of every uh, one of these that I've recorded so far, so I want to stick with tradition and say it again. Uh, time action absolutely flies um, when, it when, 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 you're, when you're having fun. Um, I, I've, I've really enjoyed it. Certainly gave us lots of food for thought uh, and gave, gave, gave us a great overview of, of all that's happening in, in the Northwest. Um, all that remains for me to say is, Brian Mulligan, you've been an absolute uh, gentleman and a scholar. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, and I hope um, to see you again sometime soon. Thank you very much, Ken. It was a pleasure.